This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. From the mid-1990s, Australia was the envy of the world in terms of productivity growth. However, when it was hailing this, a Reserve Bank said that further macroeconomic reform are needed if we're going to carry on on the path of further productivity growth and to, to stop productivity growth from slipping away. This is a subject close to the heart of Professor Fred Hilmer. He's a Vice Chancellor of the University of New South Wales. He holds an MBA from the Wharton School in the United States and is with me now. So Fred, we saw these sharp increases in productivity growth in the mid 1990s, but recently it's really come down, down quite dramatically. We've seen a real sharp decrease in productivity growth. Why is that? Well, there are a number of different explanations. Uh, one of the explanations that's given is that uh, we are hitting capacity constraints. The Reserve Bank came up with that and that because we're at a capacity constraint, we couldn't keep improving our productivity. Another was what was called the, the three sector problem, mining, agriculture, for example, uh, having a fairly rough time in terms of productivity, but that other sectors weren't doing quite as badly. So that's, a, that's another explanation. The cutting the chase, the explanation that, that I'm most concerned about is that we've really changed the policy settings for microeconomic reform. And it's it sort of happened slowly, but it really happened from the early 2000s and then accelerated after 2006. So are we seeing a, really a, a change of style here in terms of regulation and tax? What's really sort, sort of caused that, that big change? Well, if you think about you know, what drives microeconomic reform, and what drives productivity, there are two sets of things. There's one set of things that I call incentives. Competition, probably the most important incentive, but tax policy is an incentive. Governance is an incentive. You know, do you have a board of directors that is driving the firm to improve, to become more productive or not? Um, the other thing that, that drives productivity, that drives microeconomic reform, are what I call enablers. You know, do you have uh, the resources? Do you have the infrastructure? Do you have the skills? Do you have the regulatory environment? Do you have the banking system? Do you have uh, the institutions, the rule of law? Now, if you look at our, our microeconomic policy or our microeconomic strategy through the late 80s and early 90s that really drove the productivity growth, it was all about incentives. We started with tariff reform, we started with deregulation of the financial system, we, floating of the dollar, all of which helped provide incentives in terms of the global economy impacting on the Australian firm. Then the competition policy was brought in by Keating and uh, Hawke and the premiers at the time to deal with the competition and the incentives in the non-traded areas, utilities, transport, uh, infrastructure, services. So. That then was allowed to run for a number of years and it was accompanied also by very significant tax changes, the corporate tax rate coming down from the 40s to 30. And it was also accompanied by a governance environment that focused on performance of the firm rather than conformance. And that policy setting was largely put into place and money was attached to it, the so-called competition payments. And that ran out in 2006 and it was never renewed. Now, if we look at what happened when uh, Labor took power, the Rudd government took power in 2007, they actually articulated, and I think it was implicit rather than explicit, quite a different microeconomic policy. Their microeconomic policy was much more about enablers rather than incentives. The competition agenda got moved out of centre stage and it kind of drifted into the outer ministries. So we, we had regulation review really falling by the wayside. And where was all the emphasis? It was on the enablers. It's sort of a truism, but I think we all know that just because I can do something doesn't mean I will. And yet, in the simplest terms, the microeconomic policy Australia's following is all about saying what can we do rather than what will we do. And there is no evidence that that works. In fact, uh, there is good evidence that it doesn't work. 
Now, picking up on one of the things you said there, you were saying that we did go through this process of tariff reform, but I noted recently that there has been a move to, to sort of complete that process, to, to bring Australia to, together on the world stage with, with other people who've um, implemented complete tariff reform, and yet other people are arguing against it. Is there an argument that maybe we're not going far enough here? Yes, I'm, I'm less concerned about the tariff reform. I think we've come a long way and we've really got the tail to deal with, but it's not critical. I think the critical missing piece in the microeconomic policy at the moment is competition. And I think we're introducing a lot of regulation that is making it harder for people to compete or is creating de facto barriers to entry. Uh, and uh, that's why I think we're seeing a slowdown in our productivity growth. Uh, and I know that uh, the company you previously worked for, McKinsey, uh, had looked at productivity growth in other countries as well. What have they found in terms of where Australia is doing compared with, say, Japan and India? Well, we were doing very well uh, in productivity, as, as you pointed out. The McKinsey study was a study of what drove productivity growth and uh, competition was really important. And there are some great case studies that I've referred to in my work. Um, there's some of Japan. They have uh, parts of that economy like retail, uh, which is just, are just appallingly inefficient. And they have parts of their economy like the automobile industry or consumer electronics, which are really world class. And you say, well, what's the difference? All the enablers in Japan are the same. You know, a highly educated workforce, um, the same sort of institutional framework, rule of law. But what's different is the degree of competition. In the globally traded Japanese uh, f uh, firms, they're subjected to competition. The auto companies have to compete with the French and the Germans and the Americans and the Koreans and now the Chinese. The retailers don't compete with anybody and they're just living in their own little space with their own protective rules. And so that case study, and there are similar case studies in India and in Korea, show you that it's not changing the enablers in economy that makes the difference. The enablers allow you to do things, but people can get over bad enablers if the incentives are right. The incentives of competition, the incentives of tax, and the incentives of governance. And the settings that we have with respect to those incentives at this time in this country, I think, are deficient. Well, we had a perfect opportunity to increase the incentives with a Henry tax review. It obviously looked at company tax. Again, what, what's your view on this? Well, I would have liked to see uh, reductions in company rates and reductions in marginal rates. There's quite good evidence, OECD uh, evidence um, and uh, academic research that shows that as you reduce tax rates, you get lifts in productivity and performance. And I think that's an example of where we haven't been able, and for budgetary reasons, probably won't for some years, been able to use one of the levers that will help us drive productivity. And another lever, of, uh, certainly in the example you had of Japan, is of infrastructure. They've poured millions into their infrastructure in Japan. How about Australia? How's it doing in terms of developing the infrastructure it needs? I don't believe, my, my assessment, that the infrastructure that we need is the reason why our productivity growth is slow. I think we will be able to get our infrastructure by letting markets work, by improving and streamlining some of the competition frameworks around essential facilities um, and natural monopolies, and that uh, the infrastructure then would be provided by private providers and would be provided on terms that are as competitive as possible. I'm very nervous when we do um, monopoly infrastructure government supported. Uh, there's not a very good record of that creating wealth. But equally, we're now just after an election. Is it now the time ripe or is this actually a real problem in terms of economic reform? I, I think we have a real problem in terms of economic reform because the nature of what happened in our election has made it almost impossible to introduce these sorts of policies. The competition reforms that I was involved in were introduced in the early years of a new government that had a solid majority. We have no one with a solid majority and therefore the ability to take political risk uh, 
and reform does require political risk. The ability to take political risk is simply not there. And I don't think we'll see any significant change in any of the settings in the term of this government. Professor Fred Hilmer, thank you very much. Thank you. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.